Washington has been involved in many issues and raised questions that have forced the legislature in New Jersey to consider changing the law in several areas. And rather than dwell on that, I thought we'd just let Mr. Radetzky, Marty, uh, talk. And I promised his mother I'd be very good to him, so. <laughs> no way out of it. I have no problems with that. Uh, last uh, time we talked a little bit about preparation for court. You said that you want to prepare before you go there. You want to set the record. Everything you do in the courtroom should be for the purpose of setting that record. What you want to start doing is filing the most important papers that deal specifically with the issues you want to bring forth to the court. So there's no possibility of a judge setting you down before you set that record. In other words, you're saying the papers are important because even if the judge says, I'm not going to allow you to talk in court, the papers have been filed and the record is set. Yes. Can you use those papers for an appeal? Uh, yes, you can, but an appeal is, is like the fifth or sixth step. I don't want to go into those okay. things. And you're assuming with an appeal that you've lost, and w our position is we want to make it to the point where they can't, they can't make you lose in the lower court because they know it's going to be affirmed at a much higher level with greater damage at the upper upper courts. So you want to make the case before the uh, before the courts as clear as possible, so the judge knows he's going to have trouble if he tries to do anything wrong. Okay, so you you file papers. Now, and what do you do in the papers to make sure that your position is on the record? First of all, you want to make a statement of facts. And this is something that everybody should do regardless of the case. You basically write this as a diary. And the diary ideally should be in chronological order. For those of you that have computers, obviously, you can go back in and cut and paste and change things around to reorganize them. But eventually, what you want to do is you want to have a document which flows from the beginning of whatever the incident is all the way through okay. to the end of today. Let, let me interrupt a minute. One of the difficulties that I find is when you're doing writing, most of us are not professional writers. So what you have to do is you have to write it so that someone who's relatively inexperienced with any of the actions in the case can read what you're saying and understand it. And it's been told, and I, I go to lectures, and uh, they said that if you want to present something to an appellate court, be sure that an 8 or a 10-year-old could understand it. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd, I'd give the appellate judges that kind of credit, but <laughs> that's a whole different issue. Uh, th as a matter of fact, there is a joke that says, what do you call a uh, lawyer with an IQ of 80? Your Honor, Judge. And, and what do you call a, a lawyer with an IQ of 30? An appellate judge. An appellate judge, okay. <laughs> uh, the point is that when you do these statements of facts, don't force it. Don't try to sit down and dictate this thing all at one time. Write it comfortably. Don't try to fill in all the gaps immediately. Don't try to fill in things you forgot. Write it as you remember it. Then go have a cup of coffee. Some people have stronger uh, stimulants, but the point is rest and then come back fresh and read it over. And as you read it, more things will come to your mind, fill in the gaps. Okay. And if, you're, if you're handwriting, instead of writing single space, write triple space. So you have plenty of room to put these things in. Uh, Don't force these okay. issues. I was going to say, with people who write, sometimes I find index cards are best because okay. what you can do is you can then rearrange the index cards and you can insert index cards. If you're on a computer, you can write and bring different files with ideas together. I know. Go uh, ahead. The, the last part of this is what you definitely want to do with these things. Read it for continuity. How did I get from this action on Monday to this action on Friday? Whatever happened, what did happen between Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday? If it's not pertinent, forget it. If it is pertinent, if it's something that's important, you want to fill it in. And the point is, when you're all done, go back and read it one more time. And read it specifically to see if it's continuous. Okay, what I would do is, after you think you're finished, let several people yeah. read it. Yes. If they understand what you're saying without you being there, then I would say that's a good history. If you have to explain something to them... It's not good enough. 
Okay. One last part of that is that at least one of those people should not have any real knowledge of what, what happened in your case. You want to bring them in cold and say, if you read this, would you understand what I'm trying to say? Okay. Tell me what you think I'm trying to say here. Okay, I think that, that's a good point because most people aren't aware and if you try to explain something to someone else, they'll say, but I don't understand what you're talking about. And most of us tend to forget that we know the intimate details of a particular action very, very clearly, and it, it's clear to us, but for us to put it down so someone else can understand it is very, very difficult. Two things you don't want to do in these statements of facts. Number one, leave emotion out of it. Four-letter words, anything that shows that you're angry and so forth, leave that out of the statement of facts. It's a, an impersonal, uh, dry, historical entry. You don't want to make it into a diatribe. You don't want to make it as therapy. Would you say, let, let, I'll give an example. Let's say a, a policeman stops you. He pulls you over. And he stops you because, uh, well, you don't know why he stops you. Excuse me, that's the other thing which you don't want to do. Don't put conclusions. He stopped me because. What you would say is, he told me that he stopped me because. I told him this. I stated this. I quoted this law. I provided him with these papers. Whatever it is you did is fine. You don't say that he couldn't, in the statement of facts, that he couldn't do this because this law well, says he can't For example, uh, I'm driving a car on a Thursday evening. Mm -hmm. uh, I see a flashing red light behind me. I slow up because I'm not sure why there's a flashing light. I look behind me, and again, I see the car pull up parallel to me and motion me, the policeman motions me to the side of the road. Now, I can describe the fact that I'm not sure why I was, you know, brought over. I can indicate that I was motioned over to the side of the road by a police officer and then, you know, continue from that position. One last thing, and this is off point here, but it's important that you understand it. We do not advocate arguing with the policeman on the side of the road. Remember, you have no witnesses there. You, he's got a gun, and we don't recommend that you tell him you have a gun, even if you do have a gun. It is not important there. What you want to do is get this over as quickly and as safely as possible. Remember, we told it last time. Statistics show that one out of eight traffic stops leads to violence. You don't want to become a statistic. I'll give you another statistic. If you're a black person, you're more likely to be stopped by a police officer than if you're a white person. You're even more likely to be stopped. Mm -hmm. There have been several instances on the news recently, including police officers from Florida and Washington, D.C., that show this up. And I'm, those are not really what I want to get into here. Okay. This is not a bias or a uh, racial prejudice issue. It's happening to everybody. And once it's happening to everybody, the solution is to stop it. Now, with regard to your preparation for the court, you filed the papers. Now, we in New Jersey have clear laws, a little clearer than what you have in New York. You have two options. One is to fight the issue that since these laws apply in, in, New, in uh, New Jersey, why are you uh, hampered here in New York? Okay. Why do we have rights in New Jersey that you don't have? Well, very simply, as you know, uh, when this nation was formed, there were 13 state republics. And in our form of government, we have a federal government, and we have 50 states, each one with its own sets of rules, regulations, and law. And that's why there are some things that are law in New Jersey that aren't law in New York. But... Under the Equal Protection Clause, you have the right and the, the power to see that such laws that work in other states become law in yours. Okay, what's the Equal Protection Clause? You're, you're throwing terms here that okay. most people, you know... One of the things that we recommend is that everybody who sees this tape should get a copy of the Constitution and read it. It's not a big document. It's something that you should, should have at your, at your convenience. It's something which is, is easy reading and it basically recognizes all 
the rights that you have, but what's more important, it recognizes that government has very little power. And one of the problems is that they, most of what government does is in violation of the clauses of that Constitution. Okay. You raised two issues here, and you threw two terms. Okay. At least two terms. <laughs> <Please> <laughs> <do>. <laughs> and I'm going to hold you accountable. First of all, you said rights. And I'm not sure what that means. Okay. Before I, I go off point, you also said power. And I'm not sure what that means. And what you're doing is you're throwing these terms out. If I don't understand them, I can't really expect anyone who's in the audience to understand either. Okay. And you, let's get back. You, you talked about due process clause. And you haven't responded to what that is. Well, due process... Again, we, we, let, let me start at the okay. beginning, all right? In, in England, uh, nobles took King John down to the river and stuck a sword in his throat and said, if you don't sign this document, we're going to cut your throat off. What document are you talking that about? That document became known as the Magna Carta, or mm -hmm. the Great Charter. Okay. And that document was the first recorded declaration of human rights. What are rights? Rights of those things which actually are uh, uh, presentations from deity on what uh, you are really capable of doing as a human being. Okay, in other words, you're saying a higher power yes. says that as a human being you have certain rights. Mm -hmm. And most of these rights have been translated into a private ability to have life, liberty, and property. Going back to biblical times, I'm mm -hmm. sure people had rights. Yes. So obviously what we're talking about is a, sort of a modern era and where our laws sort of uh, emanate from, the Magna Carta. But remember, the Magna Carta was written in 1215. That is uh, almost, almost 800, 800, years. 800 years ago. Well, that document is a foundation for over 700 cases in the Supreme Court of this country. Now, if it was, didn't apply, it wouldn't be there. But it still does apply. Another document which you, you should look at is the Declaration of Independence. That also is a recognition of human rights. Okay. And the point is, with all these things coming down, now we have what are called rights and your ability pretty much to be let alone. That is your primary property right. Okay. I don't want to be bothered. And if I'm not bothered, I don't have to do anything with the courts. I don't even have to go to court. Give me an idea of what my rights are. You say property rights. Okay. Well, I, I have a little thing which I do in PACT, and I'll do it with you. Uh, Erwin, what gives you the right to wear that tie? I like the tie. Okay, well, you've entered the argument, you've defended your right to wear that tie. We wouldn't do that. What gives, you asked me to what okay, gives you the right. what gives you the right to wear this tie? Who says I can't? No one says you can't. That's can. the point. If, the, if the, no one... The burden of proof, Erwin has taken the burden of proof to show why he's permitted to wear his tie. I haven't defended this. I haven't said that I can or I can't. I want to know who says I can't first. Okay. Let him defend. What you did is throw in another term. Okay. Burden you throw in burden of proof. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm going to stick you. Okay. you know, every time you say something, you know what happens? Yeah. You throw in another term. People aren't aware what that term is, All right. and we're going to go back to basics. Let's go, let's go back to rights. Okay. We've established, I hope, for the moment, that rights are things that go around with you and are recognitions that you can do anything which you want to do, which doesn't violate somebody else's rights. Okay. And let's hold that for the moment. Okay. Now we go to the second word, which is powers. Powers are those things which we, in this country, delegated through the Constitution, to government. What do you mean by delegated? We've assigned government and said, we're going to allow you, go government, to enforce these laws. Okay, in other so words... So that we don't have to do it ourselves. Okay, power then is allowing someone else to do something and giving them the authority to do this? The representation and... and if power means the strength. Okay. Who, who did this? I didn't. I certainly didn't go to Washington and say, I'm giving you the power. Where is this? this where is, is this? This is documented in the Constitution itself, where the Constitution is provided for those responsibilities or powers to government, to the legislature, 
to what are called the three separate branches of government, the legislative, judicial, and executive branches of government. What's interesting to note is that in the entire Constitution, there are only 18 delegated powers to government, and of those 18 powers, 11 of them have to do with piracy on the high seas. Okay, and what, what's interesting is, and I, I just want to bring it up, the Constitution is a really small document, and you can probably read it in a half hour, maybe an hour at most. And but the most important part of that is the reason it's a small document is government has very little power. Well, okay, but you also have to recognize that each one of those one or two paragraphs has been interpreted by someone else, and sometimes there are volumes. That's, That's a whole different show. <laughs> we've now established we talked about rights and we've talked about powers. Now we talk about enforcement. Well, you raised another term before. Uh, you said that the burden of proof. I'm going to go into that. Okay. I, I, I remember I, my words. Okay, maybe I'll take notes okay. because one of the things, go ahead. All right, so what we've got, we've got rights and we've got powers. So now we've had enforcement. Uh, Irwin has broken my car's windshield. I have sustained an injury. I've been harmed. And if you don't know how I've been harmed, I'll break your window. Well, and you'll figure it out. Two, the, three hundred dollars well, worth. Okay, so the point is, Irwin does not want to pay me for the damage to my car window. I have to have some means of seeking relief to get that window paid for. I'm saying I didn't do it. Well, that's an issue to be decided. And eventually what happens is, I believe Irwin did it. I believe I can prove that Irwin did it. So I file a complaint into the court. And I don't want to go into those kind of terms in this, in this okay. thing. That's something which we'll deal with at other, other points in time. But the end result is that Irwin is, is charged with having broken my car window. This thing goes to court. Okay, when you say charged, what do you mean? You filed I've a complaint. I've accused you, Irwin, of breaking my car window. Okay. Government has said, I've established sufficient evidence to show that Irwin may have done it. Okay, the car window is broken. Yes. You file a paper, and that's called a charge. Yes. Is but that a... a it's a complaint. Okay, it's a complaint. Yeah. Now, where does this go? What kind of a court does it go well, into? You, you don't want to go into that? That level of detail, we, okay. we, it's filed with the courts, and it may be filed by you, it may be filed by the prosecutor, it may be filed by the police. There are a whole variety of ways this can be done, but it's way beyond the scope of this okay. conversation. Okay, this is an elementary type Elementary. Of what we've established is that the court has decided it's going to hear this case. Two new words come into play here, two new phrases. One is due process of law. And due process of law says there are certain rules, certain value judgments, and certain capabilities that the court must provide in order to make sure that not only do I get redress of grievances well, for you're, having... Well, you're going beyond where I want to go at this well, point. Well, I'm saying what, what I want to do is go to the court, and, but also to protect Irwin's rights, because what if he didn't do it? Okay. Now, you say due process. Where is it written? How do I know what due process is? Due process itself really isn't written. It's basically interpreted, again, by, by uh, courts, by judges, and uh, it is an enforcement claim. In order for me to show that Irwin broke my window, I have to provide certain levels of proof. Okay, by the but, same but token. beyond that, I, I usually hear due process in a different way. Well, I'm, I'm going to go into that. Okay. The point is that, by the same token, I have to make sure that I don't violate Irwin's rights so that we don't believe that Irwin did it simply because I accused him of it. Okay, in other words, I have certain rights. Yes. And the court will ensure that my rights are it's maintained? Supposed to. Oh, in other to. words, they don't do this. They don't do this all the time. Okay. And that's one of the problems that we have. Due process rights are probably the ones that are most violated. Okay. What about if you're ignorant of the law? You know, it's your problem. Isn't that I have what, some what bad, you're talking about? I have some bad news. And the bad news is I walk down, you, I, you're walking down the street, Erwin, and a bully punches you as you go past him. If okay. you go down the same street tomorrow, and he punches you again, you really have some options that you have to make a decision to look for. Well, you have to decide, you don't go down the street again, you ask for somebody to go with you, 
you may pick up a baseball bat, or you must do some other thing to stop me from hitting you again. The thing is, the government, or actually the courts, have a decision that they've come up with which says it very clearly. It's called being a belligerent claimant in person. You have to belligerently claim your rights. In other words, if I'm not represented by an attorney, I go in there myself, I have to go in and say, these are my rights and you can't take them away from me. Well, that's the second part of what I'm going to go into. But the bottom line to it is that if you don't assert your rights... Okay, that's another term. No, no, if, okay, you, if, you, don't, if you don't claim your rights, there's no one that has to claim them for you. And this case says that it, they can't be claimed by an attorney. They can't be claimed by someone who's too uh, docile, weak, docile, afraid to claim his rights. It must be claimed by a belligerent claimant in person. Okay, now I demand all of my rights at all times. I waive none of them at any time, especially my rights to time and property. Okay, we'll get into time and property, but let, let's talk about your claiming your rights. You say mm -hmm. there's a case. All right. But there are a whole bunch of cases. How do I, where do I read it? I want to read, you know, I'm not an attorney. I want to know where it says that I have these rights and that I'm the only person who can claim these rights. This is a, this is a very careful line that we draw. We read these cases as wise words from wise people. We don't take them as gospel. We don't take them as law because they are decisions made by judges and some of those decisions are very good, very supportive of private rights and some of them are pretty bad and some of them are pretty stupid. Well, and the thing is that what we try to do is we try to take the, the cases, the, 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 the wise words that support private rights and not deal with those things that violate private rights. Okay. Uh, one, of, one of the things I, I see is, you know, when I'm in court, there's a guy up there, a judge, mm -hmm. and he's supposed to know what's going <laughs> on. He's presumed to know the law. That doesn't okay. always work. <laughs> but you and I both know that in any field, especially when there's a specialization required, you don't know everything. In fact, you know very little. It's worse than that. Because effectively, no matter how much the judge knows, in, in the courtroom, he's not supposed to know anything. In other words, he's supposed to be impartial. Correct. He's now, not supposed to be biased or prejudiced. And those are terms which, again, are not part of this. Look them up in the dictionary, please. We, we, we spoke about a half right. hour before the show on just those two words, bias and prejudice. But the bottom line to these two words and the bottom line to the issue with the judges is they're supposed to come into the court and they're supposed to listen to all the parties, the people that are involved in this case, and the, the first person to speak in a case is the one that's calling the case to the court. The plaintiff is the one that says, I've been damaged, I've been harmed, there is something that I want the court to help me resolve. I want Irwin to pay me for my broken window. And I'm calling this court. I have lawful reason to make that claim to the court. I have evidence to show that Irwin did do this. Well, you know, we, we see these judges on TV, whether it's, you know, ex-mayor <laughs> Koch or Judge Judy or I someone wanna, else. And I want to repeat to this audience here, I have, in, I have asked Judge Judy to bring me onto her forum because Judge Judy deserves to go to jail. And the bottom line to all her situation is what she does in that courtroom is downright criminal. Well, the fact that they've agreed to let her do it is probably as much a point of stupidity as well, it is. Hold on. We, we all see her on television. Yes. And you're saying what she's doing is criminal. Now, Absolutely. Now, now, why should I believe you? Do you think these are fixed, are these cases? No, that, no. It isn't even that. Are, are they real cases? Or? They're, they're real cases and with what some some differences. The big differences are that it's being done in a commercial atmosphere of a television station. Well, it is a, a television station. Yes, but Judge Judy is not a judge. Do She's they simply a, an arbitrator. She's simply a mediator. Right. Do, She's simply a referee. Do they actually enforce the judgments, or does a, does a TV pay for it because the amounts are usually so small? I, I don't know. And we, I, I, I we, the issue, the issue is that the, uh, before these people go on the show, they sign contracts with the television station that they will abide by Judge Judy's decision. 
and they may be compensated for this. I don't know. I don't really care. The point is, especially in that kind of a setting, Judge Judy ain't a judge, and some of the things that she's done where she's insulted litigants, she's humiliated them, and she's broken the law in but some well, cases. well, you don't know what type of a contract Doesn't they matter. That, that's an, another issue. No, it isn't an issue, because it, when, someone, absolutely. when someone represents himself as, as a judge, there are certain levels of conduct that they must follow. Okay, you're saying that she's not following right. the level of conduct that's required of a judge. And that also is something which you can look up. It's called the Canons of, Judicia, uh, of judicial, judicial Conduct. conduct. And also, another related thing is called the Rules of Professional Conduct. And these are listed in the court rules both of New York and New Jersey. I'm not going to go into them here, but there are things that you can look up should you be interested okay. in Okay. Let's say I want to go to a library. Are they in a library? Yes. A law, any, any sufficient law, a law library would have it. Okay. Most, a fairly public large, library. most fairly large public libraries have them. The best way to find out is to ask the reference librarian. Okay. They'll tell you. Uh, I'm going to throw in a, a little kick here. If you're on the Internet, and <laughs> and <laughs> that's a big argument. No, and you want to find rules of professional conduct or canons of ethics, they're on the internet, and you just look yeah. them up. And if you don't know how, ask your ten-year-old because they're probably better on a computer than you are. All right. The last issue when I go to court. <laughs>